Hey everybody, welcome back. Wayne here. We're going to continue a little bit about what we talked last time about change. This time we're going to talk more about the transition stages of change. Like I said last time, our mission at Affair Recovery is to help those impacted by infidelity to find extraordinary lives of meaning and purpose. For us, the end goal isn't just to recover from betrayal, but to use that betrayal or the infidelity as a catalyst for transformation and change. And to that end, I hope to provide a bit of a roadmap as to how transformation can actually occur. I want to acknowledge up front that many of the concepts on transition were taken from William Bridges' book, Transitions, Making Sense of the Life's Changes. Life is full of transitions, and infidelity forces change like nothing else can. This is a problem because few of us know what to do with the change, especially when that change is facilitated by one of the most gut-wrenching, life-altering events known to life and to marriage. Most of us hope that somehow change will pass us by and let us proceed with our familiar life. But none are that fortunate. At least I haven't been and my, none of the clients that I can think of through the Rolodex in my head have been that fortunate. Infidelity isn't the only change agent that rocks our lives, though it may be one of the most significant. As humans, we also have to deal with illness, job loss, divorce, death, moving, aging, all of life's stages. You know, whether we like it or not, change is an inescapable part of life and it behooves us to learn how to use it productively, even in the case, especially in the case of marital infidelity, betrayal, and addiction. Sadly, most of us are woefully uninformed when it comes to the process of productively navigating transition. According to Bridges, transitions are composed of three components. And it may seem a little backwards, but this is how he described it. Is first, there's an ending, and then there's a neutral zone, and then there's a beginning. It's the process where we let go. We may need to let go of ways we once believed or assumed, or perhaps the opinions of ourselves or others. It could be letting go of some outlook on the world or an attitude towards others. While change or loss may precipitate transition and transformation, transition is not about external change. It's about an internal matter which transforms our understanding of who we are, of ourselves and life itself. It's a normal process. We all face it at various life stages. It is also an opportunity for growth when life is interrupted. It's the process where we move from disorientation to orientation. And for many of us, it has taken infidelity to instigate that process. It sounds impossible, but my own marriage and countless others are living proof that infidelity can be used in a way that completely transforms your marriage and the life in a very incredible way. Bridges says that one of the most important differences between change and a transition is that changes are driven to reach a goal, but transitions start with letting go of what no longer fits or serves or is adequate to the life stage where you are now. Initially, the overwhelming changes created by infidelity render most people incapable of comprehending the possibility of transition. We struggle with surviving what seems an impossible situation. Eventually, we're able to begin wrestling with endings and with transition. It's grief over time that reconciles us to the losses and allows us to get our mind around what has happened so that we can survive. It's grief over time. Please hear me in this, because this is a place where I think 99% of us miss it. It's grief over time that reconciles us to the losses and allows us to get our minds around what has happened 
so that we can survive, what I believe happens is that we think that the grief is going to swallow us up and we can't even breathe. You have to go slow, but I do believe that grief over time and experiencing it is the one that the thing that saves us and transitions us into what's ahead for us. Like I said, this is a very important and mostly overlooked step in the infidelity recovery. Most of us know about the work of, of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She identified five stages of grief. The first is shock and denial. Second is anger. Third is depression and detachment. Fourth is bargaining and dialogue. And fifth, finally, is acceptance. But one of her very close colleagues, a guy by the name of David Kessler, added a sixth stage, which he called finding meaning. I think that's a really important step as well. Most people can't begin the process of transition until they've at least partially moved through the stages of shock, anger, and depression. And in the case of infidelity, this stage can be explosive, overwhelming, and exasperating. It's not until someone enters the dialogue and the bargaining stage that the process of transition can slowly begin to take shape and form, and new alternatives can be considered. And keep in mind that the path through grief rarely, I don't think I've ever seen it actually, be a linear process. Most of us move back and forth between the different stages for quite some time. And just when you think you're done, you may go back to anger or you may go back to detachment. Don't be surprised if that happens. I, I see it every day in my office. The recognition and acceptance of these endings begins the process of transition. It's accepting what is gone and letting go of our old ways of understanding. Endings are similar to dying. It may be letting go of a part of what we once believed true about ourselves, of our spouse or relationships or God. The possibilities are endless there. It's a willingness to let go of our dreams of the life as we once saw it and understanding that those dreams are gone. It's only when our lesser dreams shatter and we let them go that we feel free to believe and live even a greater dream or life as possible on the other side. Remember I said the second stage is the neutral zone. It's the place of no more and not yet. It's both. Just the other day, I spoke to a woman in the neutral zone. Actually, most of the people I talk to in my office or on Zoom these days is in the neutral zone. Her husband had been in and out of an affair for the past several years. And with his last relapse, she finally gave up control of her marriage of 20-something years. She had been considering the endings for months and realized that her old ways of looking this, at this no longer served a purpose. For her, it was time to let go. Her tears had been shed, and she had gracefully reached the place of acceptance. She wasn't sure that her marriage would survive. For her, that was no longer the point. In the process of transition, she had let go, and she no longer saw things as she had or needed what was once important. All too often, we want to rush this process of the neutral zone. And let me tell you, I, hear me, you do it. Everybody does it. I see it every day. We rush this process. No matter what you're dealing with, this transition, this neutral zone is really important. We're uncomfortable with the feelings of emptiness and hurt and sadness and uncertainty and the list goes on. People think it's strange when we just want to be alone and we want to walk or we want to journal, we want to think, we need to process, especially when it's difficult to verbalize the process of what you've been thinking. It's just accepting where you are and being okay with that. It's a time of waiting for what's to come next and being okay with not knowing, but knowing that in time, it will all come together. It's a place of being quiet and still waiting for what comes next. 
And then this leads to that final stage of a new beginning. In the process of transition, we don't come to the beginning until we've reached the end, not until old ways of thinking and coping are abandoned can new possibilities come into our awareness. Once we release our dreams of how life ought to be, we're free to take stock of what we've got and what we're able to create, create new ways of being, new, a new life. You know, one of the definitions that we use here at Affair Recovery is that forgiveness is giving up all hope of ever having a better past. By that we mean it's a willingness to let go of the old and make way for the new. You know, you've heard this before too, many of you that come from a faith background, that you, you can't put new wine into an old wineskin. It'll rip apart. But rather, new wine requires new wineskins. It's the letting go of the old that makes way for the new. So often, the first hint of what is to come next appears as a whisper or a subtle idea, an impression, or an image. And from there, a new passion and desire can begin to grow as we follow the new dreams and the visions. Life transitions are a requirement. They're gonna happen if we are to grow and let go of the old, and sometimes even childish ways. It's our choice. I say this all the time, that we all have a choice about how we respond to life and to our partner, to God, you name it. I believe in that free will and that choice as adults. We didn't always have that as a kid, but we do now. It's not about right circumstances. It's about taking the right steps. And few things in this life are more difficult to face than infidelity. But at the same time, we, we get to choose how we're going to respond to that. And let me just stress this. What I've talked about in this newsletter is not applicable for those early in the stages of recovery. If you just found out, come back to this newsletter in three or four months or six months or a year. As long as the change created by infidelity seems incomprehensible, there's little hope of transition or transformation. You're still at an early stage of grieving and coming to a place of acceptance where you can begin exploring the edges around that ending. And that may be exactly where you need to be right now, and it's totally cool. But grieving takes time, and that the amount of time depends on each person and their unique situation and the things that happen to us from the years of zero to 18 for most of us. I will say this, that no matter what stage you're in, I'd encourage you to find a community a community of other people of similar uh, situation that you can walk alongside with. And if you don't know where to look for a community of others who are walking this same path, I'd invite you to join us at Affair Recovery. You'll find help in navigating changes you didn't, even, you didn't ask for. The Harboring Hope program is this perfect place to start for you that have been betrayed through infidelity and sexual addiction. I think it could be really the perfect place for you to start as you go through this journey of, of healing and reconciliation and the transitions that are required there and then ultimately transformation. I think it'd be a really big help for you. Thanks so much for joining me again this week. It's always good to be with you. I just thank you for your time. Stay safe and healthy. Know that we care deeply about each and every one of you. Thanks so much.